also the theme leader of the Adaptive Primary Industries, Enterprises, and Communities theme. He's developed national and international greenhouse gas inventories for the agricultural sector and assess practical adaptation options. Today, he will be talking about climate adaptation in Australia, successes, failures, and lessons learned. Thanks, Rachel. I'll just finish my yummy cakes, <laughs> which is really, really good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what I'll, I'll do is just give a, you know, a bit of a, a, a scape over the sort of topic about adaptation. And, uh, and so, so my, my slide set is too big, so some of the slides will be done fairly sort of briefly. Um, but one of the key things, uh, just a couple of sort of background slides, is that if you actually look at what's happening already, this is a Southern Australian temperature record, is that the climate change is hard to ignore. Um, and, and even with sort of die-hard uh, groups, they're starting to accept um, you know, that, that the, the globe is warming and, and, and warming's happening at a regional level. And some of these changes are fairly significant. So from a human perspective, if you look back sort of 50 years, um, you know, in this region, you've got a, a, a sort of a warm year and a cold year sort of scenario, and they don't vary by that much. Like it's only a bit over um, one and a half degrees bet between the two on a on a regionally average basis. But you can see, if you look at the same sort of thing that's happening right now, is that a, a cold year now is actually as warm or warmer than a than a hot year um, 50 years ago, uh, and and, the, and last year in southern Australia, uh, as in the rest of Australia, was um, the warmest on record. And, and, that, and that sort of degree of change, you know, sitting up here is, is, is really substantial and we see it expressed in lots of different ways around the, around the country in terms of uh, biology, etc. And, and if you look at you know, just what's happening in Australia, this is just last year, um, in the 2000, oh, this is actually from an Arizona presentation I gave, so, it was in, so it's in Fahrenheit, but ignore that because the, the message is basically the same. Is that you know, 2013 was the hottest year on record for Australia. Um, the the mean was way above um, anything we would have expected at this point in terms of climate change. Maximums even higher um, than the means in terms of the anomaly, the difference from the average, uh, and minimums um, second highest on record. We also had the hottest day, the hottest week, the hottest month, the longest national heat wave, and the warmest winter day. And there was a whole raft. Hello, Lauren. <laughs> whole raft of other. Um, changes, you know, war records which are broken. And, and it's that sort of thing uh, which, which starts to impact on people's consciousness. Uh, so for example, in Canberra, where I live, is that we didn't get our first frost um, until uh, the first week of winter. Um, normally it happens two months earlier. Um, almost invariably, um, those first frosts in, in where I am um, happen around about mid-April to late April, so Anzac Day sort of period. And so it's actually extraordinary, you know, like not just a marginal outlier, but this is a massive outlier in compared with the sort of historical experience. And so those are the start things that start to actually impact on how people think about climate and their experience, their own, um, you know, the, the actual lived experience. Just a, a couple of quick slides here. This one's from the IPCC uh, Working Group to Chapter 7 on food security that I was a lead author on. And we summarised the literature which is showing how climate change is already impacting on crop yields at a regional and at a global level. And when we summarise this, so the, the bars are a frequency of estimates, so the number of studies in essence, uh, and we can see this is the essentially, um, you know, most of the studies actually showing some degree of negative impact on crop yields um, already. Um, so we don't have to wait for 2030 or 2050 for this to happen, but in fact, that the evidence is that in many regions, um, the climate change we're already seeing are impacting on uh, crop yields. Uh, there's some studies which are, are non significant and some which actually increase. So you wouldn't expect climate change to be negative in all places, but when we look at this sort of evidence on, a, on, on an aggregate basis, that it's negative and already negative in terms of crop yields. And so, the sort of percentages we're talking about might not sound much, you know, 2%, 5%, up to 10 but, but even something like a, a 5% um, difference in crop yields um, can feed a couple hundred million people across the globe. So, um, so you're, you're talking about 
uh, sort of changes um, that roughly in sort of their magnitude equal the number of starving people on Earth. And that's what's already happening in terms of climate change. So, so these are non-significant changes if those analyses are ready. More close to home is what we find is a lot of farmers, but not all, um, say that, yeah, things are changing already. You know, it's like seeing those scenarios coming true in front of our eyes. So this is a quote from John Pettigrew, and just lives up, on the, uh, up in Shepparton here in Victoria. And, and because of that recognition that things are changing, um, even though they might not attribute it to human influence, so that I'll accept that climate is changing, but not necessarily that humans are the cause of that. Um, but if they, they, that acceptance that the climate is changing, and because agriculture is so strongly linked to, to climate factors, um, they, the rationale for changing their practices in some way is very strong. And so we see very strong uptake of adaptation practices in Victoria and elsewhere. And so there's some really good survey work um, done uh, here in Victoria which demonstrates that. And when I talk about adaptation, it's essentially just changing what we do to get what we want. So it's, it's a, a change process which has um, you know, uh, a, a whole stack of subjective and, and individual elements about you know, wants and needs, etc. And there's a collective element there as well. Um, so that's why I've got we in the, in the definition. Getting what we want <coughs> means continuing to do what Not we do to drive and then change. We have to tackle mitigation as well as adaptation. It's really hard to separate them. <coughs> and yeah. how, in your experience, how do farmers deal with that? Because they've kind of got their hair in adaptation. What's their mindset on the mitigation? Depends if there's money attached to it in, in most cases. So, uh, and, and you know, I could have done a different talk, which is about adaptation, mitigation, sort of interactions, etc. But, but basically, um, you know, farmers, in my, in my experience, as farmers around the world, um, they will take mitigation seriously if there's a buck in it for them. So, if there's a carbon tax or some sort of offset sort of benefit from it, um, some of the sort of greener ones will actually start to do practices because because it, uh, um, uh, you know, that accords with their values, uh, and some of them will do those practices because it increases the capital value of their asset, their farm, um, and uh, but, but broadly uh, that the private benefit uh, comes mostly from being adaptive. So um, is it almost like the difference the mitigation is a, uh, you know, a public benefit, um, you know, it's a global good, um, and adaptation is largely a private benefit, but those are hard boundaries there. They're um, soft and they do interact and, and there is some you know work uh, going on everywhere else in the world which you know looks at that interaction. Anyway, um, I, the title of the talk is a bit about failures and successes. So one of the failures um, is that uh, as a science community and, and more broadly we've actually failed to win over our leaders. So we have a PM who says that climate change is crap um, at national and state levels. Uh, Climate change has almost been completely removed from policies and programs uh, and, and in institutionally in structures. So very rare to find a climate change department anywhere in Australia these days. Um, but a few years ago, they were pretty much everywhere. Um, we've got high profile people who sort of fit into the denier camp. Um, and you can use different words there. I've just put anti-climate change um, because you know, there's discussion about whether they're sceptical or, or um, deniers, etc. But for example, the um, PM's chief business advisor has said, you know, again in, in, uh, in public, that you know, climate change is a scientific delusion and the IPCC resorts to honesty, dishonesty and deceit uh, in its proceedings. So, um, very hard to uh, sort of equate this with um, a, an idea that we've got a balanced approach uh, in terms of uh, these issues. And, and the problem here is that a um, really nice study by a guy called Joe Brule um, in the US who, who showed uh, through uh, sort of an analysis of, of media and other information and linking that with surveys on attitudes to climate change uh, that political leadership was the fundamental uh, cause of um, distinctions in and public attitudes. So if you've got the leadership which is actually uh, accepting of climate change and uh, proactive in relation to it, so Germany being one example, um, uh, you get very rapid changes. Uh, you get changes in, in public attitudes, you get changes in business investment, you get changes in policy. And so you can actually have quite rapid um, 
sort of movements forward. Uh, the opposite example may be Canada, um, where in fact you get rapid winding back of, of attitudes and action, uh, and largely because of that leadership. So if this analysis is right, then in, in its essence, um, you only need to convince one person in a country like Australia, and that's the PM. And you all have a different PM, of course. But, um, but, uh, but if you did that, all of a sudden, the, the bipartisan approach to climate change, where essentially whether you believe in climate change are prepared to take action or not, um, it dissolves because you actually remove that leadership barrier um, to, to action. And so, so there's, a, I would argue, a strong element here um, that we actually, as a science community, haven't achieved uh, that understanding within our leadership cohort um, that allows uh, us to make that progress. You compare this with the US, where you actually have a, a, um, a president uh, who acknowledges climate change and sees this as a really important strategic issue for his country, and they uh, have got um, now a massive amount of activity going on in terms of climate change, like the you know a, a billion dollar program, which is probably going to be announced in terms of uh, climate adaptation and action. Uh, activities. They've got an executive order um, in terms of emission reductions. They've got the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, over there, and they've just launched um, the National Climate Assessment uh, for the US. And I was part of the Federal Advisory Committee on that, uh, and and it's um, just had massive impact across the country. And so uh, it's um, very very strong engagement processes there, uh, and the information. Uh, demand uh, that's being experienced because of that is huge. Um, and to some extent it's because people have been operating in an information vacuum previously and so here's something which is new and informative and the demand for that's huge. So if we go back to um, the Vote Compass uh, survey um, just at, at the time of the last election, is we essentially saw a really interesting difference between adaptation and mitigation, to come back to the thing you were asking there. So if we actually looked at the sort of question which is largely related to adaptation, which is about doing stuff uh, in terms of dealing with climate change, we saw you know, a really, really large proportion of the population saying we should do a lot more in terms of adaptation. In terms, and so that's, in essence, not sh shouldn't be a political issue because adaptation makes sense regardless of which side of the politics you sit on. And you can see, in essence, because of that lack of partisan issues, we get a really strong uh, agreement that action is needed. If we look at mitigation where there is that bipolar sort of aspect to it, uh, we see that there's actually a much, much um, less clear um, interest in mitigation with uh, these sort of classes up here, people wanting a lot more action and um, being roughly the same as the people who say we don't want anything happening. So um, that, that sort of issue about the politics of it, I think is actually really important and you can see that coming out in those uh, sort of analyses there or surveys. In terms of the science, I actually think that a lot of the science that we've been doing here and elsewhere in the world is actually not particularly effective if you're thinking about getting a more adaptive society. Um, and there's a whole range of reasons about why the science that we do in climate and in other domains is not very effective and there's just a few of the, the reasons why and there's been a lot of research on those done over um, decades and, and Lauren's probably more able to talk about the ineptness of, of science in terms of dealing with uh, real issues um, than I am, but uh, we can quiz her later on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, so all of these things I think we can actually address if we're, if we're self-reflective and if we have appropriate institutional arrangements, um, but at the moment they're not necessarily done. It also does raise some of the questions about um, sort of decision makers and, and who's sort of uh, got different responsibilities in terms of different aspects of adaptation. Uh, and, and it's really important, I think, to move um, you know, very strongly from sort of a climate-centred focus in terms of, of our inquiry to a much more decision-centred focus. So it's actually saying, well, what are the decisions that you've got to make? What are the values that you have? And how do we actually start to integrate um, climate information into those so we can actually have more informed um, adaptation actions? So one of the key messages in terms of uh, sort of the successes and failures, if we are to move from our analysis to action, so action is real and meaningful, um, we have to ask some questions for ourselves. And, and, you know, it's the sort of things up above, you know, which is what's the goal of adaptation, who adapts how and, you know, when and why and what, are, what does it look like. Um, a lot of the time, 
uh, when I look at the science domain, is that we actually, when we do something on, say, adaptive capacity or vulnerability, um, we, we go out there and we do a, a sort of analysis and we say, yes, um, this is high here and low there. Um, but the, the information that's generated doesn't either inform or doesn't get carried through to processes which allow adaptive capacity to be built or vulnerability to be reduced. So, so the, it's science which just is analysis that doesn't actually inform action very well. And, and I think there's a, quite a lot of that that goes on. And if we're going to sort of get action happening, um, it has to be integrated with other issues because climate change doesn't exist in isolation from other issues. Uh, and you can't do it without partnerships with the people who are actually taking action. So um, doing this as a bunch of scientists um, will not, in most cases, actually lead to any significant change. So if you want your science to be useful, um, you actually need to have partnerships at some level. Don't want to go into the detail of this, except just um, one of the things we've learnt uh, in CSIRO and in other sort of groups is that you have to treat climate adaptation as a journey, not as a destination. So um, as climate will continue to change, you will need to change your views on adaptation and you need to change your adaptation strategies. And, and so what we find um, through sort of multiple engagements with the same groups is that what those groups start off as is a very much a focus on the technical but as they start to learn and think about what these issues are, they start to think much more about strategic business management rather than the technical. So it's about learning skills in terms of making um, good strategic decisions and having the planning and capacity to actually um, make those happen. We've also learned that you've got to talk the language of our stakeholders. I really like this slide. Uh, you know, Climate change threatens our existence and they all just sleep, all the businessmen down the front. And yet, climate change threatens our economy and a major concern. And, and you can see this parallels for this discussion happening all through the media. It's actually quite fascinating. You talk the language of economy and you actually start getting engagement with a whole group of people who otherwise um, essentially uh, treat this as a, a, a non-event. And money talks. So if you're doing analyses, convert the information into dollars. This is a study I did ages ago now. Um, looking at frost risk and changing frost risk in the northern part of the wheat belt. And if essentially the message was if you ignored frost risk, you made some money. If you, if you take a 100 year view of frost risk, you make roughly the same amount of money. Um, but if you actually have an adaptive view of frost risk, you almost double your income, or double your gross margin in this case. And so essentially the message here is that changing with the times and changing with the climate uh, makes a hell of a lot of sense from an economic point of view. It, it reduces risk increases your performance. So making sure that you actually communicate with your stakeholders in, in terms of the things they're interested in is pretty fundamental. We've also done a whole stack of stuff with science and policy, um, both in the practice of doing this, but also in the analysis of doing this. And what we're trying to do uh, within my group at CSIRO is, is alter the sort of discussion within this uh, policy domain from a, a, century, a, a science gap or information gap model uh, to something which is what we call a, an economic policy agenda, which, which looks at things like market and public values failures and the reasons why um, you've got barriers and thinking about institutional responses to that. Um, we see this as a really important step in a policy domain to move from focus on, on sort of problems and, and issues to focus on solutions. And you can't forget the people. Um, this is work from Martin Hannigan at ANU and others, uh, which relates suicide rates to drought stress. So um, quite interesting sort of links here. So, so generally speaking, as your, as your um, drought stress increases, you get increases in suicide rates for specific components, specific groups within uh, the rural sector, um, but not everyone. So, um, your younger males, in this case, have increased risk as drought stress increases. But your older males actually have the opposite. If you look at females, um, almost all of the female class age classes go down as drought stress goes up. So you have gender-based differences and age-based differences in terms of response. So if you understand this, then you can start to target uh, rural counselling services much more effectively. You know that as these things happen, you don't have to focus on the whole community. There's particular age groups and particular agendas which you can focus on and actually have more effective use of the available resources. So, so Mark, is there a psychological reason for that? And in particular, should we be encouraging more droughts because that will increase the, reduce the death rate 
across the whole population? Well, apart from the fact that we can't really encourage more droughts, oh, yes, since beyond the... Yes, we can. The, You've done it well in the US. <laughs> the, um, as, as a community here, um, we, we can't. If, um, if you're talking about a global response, well, uh, you know, that's a, a different issue. But even um, in Australia, why do women and old men like you and I cope better with droughts and, in fact, have less chance of suicide? Well, we, we speculate in that paper, um, and uh, and there's ongoing research about this. But but um, one one sort of ob obvious sort of uh, um, pop psychology perspective on this one, uh, which is unsupported at this stage by good data, is um, uh, is that as as things um, get stressful, uh, males tend to isolate. They go into their shells and they they um, uh, focus inwards. Uh, as things get stressful for a lot of women, they actually act as a group and so they actually go and talk to each other and they'll actually support each other and so you get a very very different social response um, to the same stressor. That's probably the, what's happening. Um, we can also do things like um, estimate adaptive capacity but more importantly we can actually track that so we can actually use these measures of adaptive capacity or vulnerability and actually track them over time so we can actually start from a policy perspective um, to see where areas with Persistent problems such as southeast New South Wales, which is known from the literature as being a region of persistent uh, drought uh, problems, uh, not because the drought occurs there more frequently on a proportional basis, but because there's there's endemic um, issues in terms of uh, that region in terms of how they respond to the, the given stressor. Um, we can also do things like uh, analyse what are the, some of the barriers uh, to adaptation and how they differ um, by sort of industry by region, etc. And understanding this gives us information to act. Uh, and we can understand uh, better how uh, adaptation can be uh, taken into a, a pathway for adoption. So um, some of these sort of, um, sort of, sort of classic criteria um, coming from Everett Rogers' work back in you know, 50 years ago uh, about you know, compatibility and trialability and observability um, are key criteria for um, adaptation adoption um, at the current time. But they're all actually very difficult um, because they actually require, in a sense, a, a bit of a, a virtual uh, assessment of trialability or compatibility. And, and so as a result, you know, at least a, as a first step, um, dealing with these things in terms of existing risks and existing systems um, makes some sense for adoption. We also need to um, focus on adoption and of adaptation that doesn't require certainty in terms of climate. So, so what we um, can see um, through the GCM output is that um, in many, for many variables such as rainfall, is that uh, the current GCM outputs, the um, CIMIP 5 uh, ones, often provide fairly little information um, at the time scale of interest. So they can give you signals at say 2050 or 2070 um, but not within the time scale that most farmers or policymakers are interested, which is you know from now to the next 10 years or thereabouts. And so we get a, a, you know a whole stack of issues which arise from that. And so so one of the things is if you if you want to sort of talk to people about changing a practice, you've got to go down the pathway of, of um, you know what's a, what are low regrets, and no regrets, and robust options, uh, and have discussions with them on a scenario basis rather than a projection basis. Um, and, and there's other ways of approaching some of the risk management like real options as well. But the key message is, is we can't afford to make climate change projection uncertainty and um, focus of discussion either with people who are practicing or with policy makers. And just a, an example of um, the challenges here, this is a um, uh, work uh, from CIMIC 5 models for Western Australia. Um, basically what this shows is that this little coloured line here is the um, observations of rainfall in this region, southwest WA. Uh, these are the um, GCM sort of indicated range of, of variation or change in rainfall, and I'll just zoom in on this. And essentially, what it says is that the, the observed running mean for rainfall um, is actually around about where the mean of the GCMs suggest uh, the change is going to occur in about 2050. So, so assuming that these are, are sort of robust estimates. Um, we're already in a 2050 scenario, we're not in a 2014 scenario in terms of rainfall. Um, 
if we continue just to rely on the GCMs as our main source of information, um, we could be 40 years um, behind the eight ball. Um, and if you actually start to talk with governments about that, um, that should be a cause of concern in my view. Um, without going into the detail of this, is that there's a real big question for some industries and some activities whether we actually have the adaptation options ready. Um, so sometimes we do. We've got things which farmers can take off the shelf or miners can take off the shelf, um, and sometimes we don't. And for those things that we don't, we actually need to think about investment in those adaptation <coughs> options. We also need to be comprehensive, so there's a tendency for people to automatically focus on their existing systems and incremental the change to those systems. We argue that you need to think um, bigger and broader about potential adaptations, including what we call transformational adaptations. So Lauren and I have written on that, and, uh, and there's, it's one of the buzzwords in climate adaptation at the moment, um, with it popping up in every second sentence at the recent uh, Fort Laser Conference on Adaptation. And, and, and in terms of that, we've done some work on social network analysis of incremental versus transformational ad ad adapters, and this, this has just been accepted for natural climate change. Uh, and what this is, is a, a social network analysis of, uh, in this case, an incremental adapter versus a transformational adapter, and it's looking at the social support networks, the sort of thing about the drought question that David just asked. You know, Why may uh, women um, sort of be more resilient to drought stress? So one would suggest that part of that's a social network. So for incremental adapters, they have really, really strong social, social support, and, it's, and a lot of it's local, so it's actually within um, the local region. Whereas the transformational adapters have a much, much weaker um, social network, and a lot of that's actually at a distance, so they're dealing with people um, considerably outside the local area. If we compare this to the information networks, we have incremental adapters, often have weak information networks, still quite local, and the transformation adapters have extremely strong information networks, and again, very much out of distance and geographically. So fundamentally different sort of ideas about um, adaptation, about the social networks, about the information networks, about the support uh, networks um, that are needed for different types of adapters. If we have a one-size-fits-all approach, um, we will get it wrong for one group or other or both. And so um, we need to understand something about the social dynamics of adaptation. And of course, in all of this, we need to think about avoiding maladaptive responses that don't do dumb things. Um, and almost invariably, we find that um, you know, maladaptation is readily apparent after the fact. So you get a, a range of responses by, by whoever, you know, farmers or miners, etc. Um, and some of these, when they work, will almost go without a lot of comment. But when they don't work, um, they'll actually get a lot of criticism from those people who um, didn't sort of acknowledge the issues in the first place. Uh, and of course, this has to be viewed in a, in a long-term risk sort of view, is that uh, you can't expect any given response, either no response or a, a, you know, adaptation response, to show its merits uh, in the very short term because we've got a very stochastic climate. So you actually need to run these things out for quite a while in terms of the numbers of years before you'd really be sure that we've got a sensible response or not a sensible response. And right across the board, I actually think there's a really interesting question about what does good adaptation look like. I, I don't think it's actually an easy one to answer. And, and how to measure it. So measuring it's a fundamental to evaluation of policies and practices. And in terms of our science, we actually need to adapt as well. So if, if you know, in this case it's climate change, but for most issues, um, if you're going through a series of questions as the issue evolves and matures, it might be something like this. First of all, you ask, is it real? Secondly, does it matter? Thirdly, can we do anything about it? Um, fourthly, how do we take action? And fifthly, how do we know we're doing the right thing? And if you actually sort of think about those questions, the first few are really about biophysical sort of issues. Um, the next ones are much more about uh, economics and social issues. And right down the bottom, it's actually much more of philosophical and sometimes political um, discussion about um, what we're doing. But one of the things that I observe is that a lot of the time, as we go through these sorts of questions, we sort of get down to about here or here, um, and then we just go, boom, straight up the top. You know, So we say, oh, we need more information from GCMs or something like that. And so we, we go almost like back up to the start of, you know, is it real, you know, more evidence from GCMs. And so we get in this sort of groundhog day loop of 
of forever staying in this part of the set of questions and science focusing more and more and increasingly reductionist on these sorts of things rather than actually pushing the issue down into these domains. So there's an issue about sort of lack of handover of science um, to different groups as you progress the issue, um, which I think we're seeing <coughs> as part of the change. Would you also see a, a splintering of consensus as you move down through not, those questions? Not necessarily. Well, if you're looking at a biophysical space, for example, scientific consensus can be achieved. I'm not saying everyone's going to agree that you'll get a leading theory or whatever it might be. As you get down to the bottom of that, you know, state cause and philosophies and so on, it's an absolute plethora of views and perspectives. And there isn't a formula that can give you the right result. So you, know, you do get this splintering of consensus. And yeah. I think that might explain why it's difficult. Yeah, well that's why we actually need need um, sort of different approaches that actually deal with you know different value sets uh, and uh, you know different understandings of, of you know meanings of, and things like that. So, but I, I don't actually know that that's necessarily true because when we actually come down to some of these things, you know, how do we take action? Um, there can be um, bringing together of uh, different perspectives. So, for example, in Germany, with the uh, focus on renewables. So. Um, you can actually take that sort of splintered sort of perspective of economic benefit and environmental benefit and through leadership bring that into a, a reasonably strong focus. Uh, not, it won't be completely coherent, you'll get some dispute around the edges of this, but you can also bring it together into something which is quite concrete. So I don't think it's necessarily true, but if you don't look after it and you don't take care of it, it probably will splinter. So just, um, just a summary. Um, so, you know, for me, I think you know, climate change is a clear and present danger. We don't have to wait to 2030. Um, but it also can be an opportunity for some people. So it's a question about how you approach these things. Um, we, we need to get action. We need compelling engagement and communication strategies. Uh, we need to focus on building adaptive capacity, not just assessing it. Uh, we need to focus on outcomes and adoption paths with appropriate methods and with tools available ahead of time, not always lagging behind, as we often do. Um, we need to think about integration, cross-sectoral, cross-issue. Uh, we need to think comprehensively, so it's not just limited to the existing systems. Uh, we need to have more effective evaluation and monitoring. There's almost none of this that goes on globally. Uh, and we need to link that to decisions, so it's not just um, a monitoring industry. And we need to think about our own science and how to change that, so we adapt our science um, so that we actually have impact uh, in the broader community. Thank you very much. different. 
uh, in a lot of uh, other industries, I think we've seen an under-recognition of, of climate risk, and so, so, for example, in mining industries, and so there's, uh, they're probably exposed to risk that they don't necessarily have to um, uh, live with if they actually being more, uh, you know, cognizant of, of, of change. And so, um, some of that's, uh, you know, got to do with their, their business models and their, their frames of reference in terms of time frames. Uh, some of it's got to do with issues to do with uh, uh, assessment processes which are you know, driven by particular policy perspectives. Uh, and so, so I think there's a very mixed perspective that, that's how I uh, view it. And, uh, but in other respects, I think we've become more adaptive in a, in a narrow sense. Uh, so if you're looking at health, uh, for example, I think we've, we've got a whole series of systems in place which are uh, better than they would be, in, say, in the 70s. And, um, uh, including things like um, air conditioning, uh, much more frequent for um, you know, hot days, acknowledging that that feeds well, <coughs> you know, climate change, etc. So, um, if, if, I, if you had to ask me on aggregate, um, are we better prepared and more adapted than we were, say, three or four decades ago? The answer would be yes. Um, could we be better prepared and adapted? The answer is also yes. Mm -hmm. David, any point? Um, so, you talked quite a bit about you know, adaptation in different aspects. You know, there's some specific cases where, what I say, the uh, government influence or policy makers influence has actually perhaps even adversely impacted the adaptive capacity. And a lot of what you've described is based on a perhaps rational approach at the individual and local level to avoid interference from policy makers and two examples that I would say is the response to bushfires and the response to sea level rise impacts that both state government and other aspects. Policy makers in some areas, particularly in Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland, have sought to deny the existence of climate change as an adaptive risk factor. Um, how can people at the local level be allowed to say, get on, or, or be encouraged to avoid risks, and the policy makers basically say there isn't a risk. Yeah. Current policy. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's more dynamic than that. Right. So, 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 for example, you see in, in various uh, jurisdictions, uh, you know, initial ignorance of climate change or sea level rise, uh, um, then some recognition and adoption of often uh, you know individual targets, mm -hmm. and so you know, 90 centimeters, etc. Uh, and and uh, over the last couple of years, sort of trying to pull back on those targets. Um, and in some sort of state jurisdictions, you've had uh, overarching uh, policies which which actually require um, you know sea level rise to be taken into account, and others don't. Uh, and and then there's a lot of dynamic dynamics happening at the local level. So, you know, one of my ex-colleagues uh, was down at Batman's Bay and there's a, a really strong push in the local council to sort of um, have, have a number, but the number is actually so low well, it's, it's you know, ridiculous in terms of the scenarios. And so um, they tick off the box, you know, for having a sea level rise target sort of thing and, and having planning that, that meets that. Um, but it's actually meaningless in practice because we, we've almost already exceeded the, uh, the sea level rise that they're target, targeting. So, um, uh, so it's very, it's very mixed. Um, in the end, um, all of these things actually require um, a degree of uh, um, broad public acknowledgement, and you know that there is an issue, and and also broad policy acknowledgement that there are pathways to resolve this which are cost effective and acceptable. So those, those are really core cool criteria. And, and going back to my initial point about leadership, so yeah. without leadership, that's much much harder to, to achieve. But not impossible. You've seen it happening in other uh, jurisdictions, in the US, for example, where uh, different states have, have actually generated things like you know emission targets, and uh, you know separate from the national uh, you know reluctance to do so. So, and so it can happen. It's just uh, it's really driven by by people and it's driven by understanding the issues. Um, you said you thought one of the most interesting questions was what does good adaptation look like. Do you want to hazard a description for us? 
a really interesting thing. Is that um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a blur. I mean, for me, it's actually really blurry. Is that um, it's uh, because it will will change from time to time and place to place. So so in agriculture, a classic example would be a fence line effect. So you can go out right today and you can see one farmer um, who will farm one way uh, and another who will um, farm a different way. And the adaptation response here is different from the adaptation response there. So it varies uh, on a scale of centimetres, <laughs> you know, the, the, the response. So you can see how the, um, the values and strategies and uh, ideas about risk can vary from place to place. And, uh, and so um, what good adaptation looks like for one person is different from another. What that will look like in the midst of the millennium drought will look different from what they think it looks like right now. And so there's no, there's no simple answer to this one. Is that in the end, um, this will come down to uh, effective risk management and an effective strategic decision making. And, uh, and good adaptation will have very strong elements of both of those in there. And underpinning that will be a very explicit understanding of, of what the values are that you know, are underpinning your sets of, uh, um, sort of sets of decisions. And, and also the ability to um, explicitly integrate these um, issues um, in, in ways that are meaningful for your, your entity of interest, whether it's a farm or a family or a suburb, etc. So, so, so at the moment, I don't think we have an answer. And that's why I raised them, because I don't think we have an answer. Um, so so we're, we're at the stage where um, in a, as a science community, often um, still focusing on the sort of technical rather than actually focusing on some of the underlying things. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of stuck between two things. Um, one is Um, I guess there's the potential to integrate 
adaptation with other issues. Rich, did you your thoughts on the capacity of other issues to basically lead to maladaptive responses? Um, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking as an example of um, uh, the cattle grazing up in Queensland. Like, to me, the, sort of the, the drought assistance kind of packages that are proposed or being implemented now are, in a way, a, a sort of maladaptive response to what well, they could be perceived as a, they're not adaptive, they're actually, I guess, propping up an industry that may not be viable in the future. So, so the history of drought goes back a long way, um, back to um, Aboriginal times. So we can actually see through uh, sort of paleo records um, that Aboriginal populations were affected by you know, major drought events and in some cases uh, permanently affected. So you know, migration patterns which uh, effectively didn't get reversed. So, um, and then uh, you know, during the very first days of the, uh, the first fleet in Sydney Cove, they hit, hit a drought you know, in the first couple of years. Uh, and, and subsequent, you know, we probably all know the story about that land of droughts and flooding rains. So, um, so, so drought is a permanent feature of Australian environment. In 1990, uh, we adopted the, the national drought policy, which which acknowledged that. And and because it is uh, a normal feature, um, that we uh, said farmers have to take that into account in terms of management and become self-reliant, so that we wean them off the uh, sort of public. Uh, subsidies associated with, with um, sort of drought monies, uh, and, uh, and and there was various uh, changes in that policy, uh, which had what we call exceptional circumstances, which is a way of still getting getting money out to farmers in, in exceptional <coughs> cases, etc. Um, uh, back a couple of years ago, uh, 2008 2009, uh, we removed that exceptional circumstance component uh, and focused instead of enhanced training, so farmers would be better um, risk managers and, uh, and able to think about uh, changes in risk, not just a um, static view of risk. So there was a, a drought pilot in WA which um, was evaluated as being very successful uh, in terms of providing people with the tools for better planning and better strategic decisions. Um, what we've seen, uh, and, and, and climate change is part of that. So, so the government looked at the frequency of droughts now and in the future and said, uh, the current policy of exceptional circumstances, as in 2008, uh, was uh, unviable and undesirable um, because of the expected increased frequency of drought. And so that actually contributed to removal of that policy. Uh, what we've seen now is, is uh, a, some reinstatement of uh, some of those um, subsidies um, or you know, ways of, of supporting uh, farmers in drought, uh, which takes back some path you know, down that pathway of, 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 um, of policy change. Um, to put it in perspective, though, it's relatively small internationally, so what's called our producer support levels, so it's the proportion of, in a sense, the proportion of farm income that comes from uh, me mechanisms completed through drought is just about 3%. Uh, the only OECD country with less is New Zealand. Um, if you look at the US, I think it's um, running at 18% uh, and the EU is higher than that, 20 something. So, um, uh, so on a global scale, we're actually, even though we have some of these these sort of ways of, of supporting farmers, they're really quite small compared with what happens in many other countries. Um, I would say examples of local councils throughout the in my view, have really tried to protect the bull by the horns and get the great players to think about adaptation and Flagged in their property prices. 
similar issue happened up um, just south of Newcastle, where the council introduced a, I think it's only got to the proposal stage, but they wanted to put on certificates of title the fact that there was a high flood risk inherent if it was a raft of properties. And similarly, the owners just completely jacked up and closed it all down because they didn't want their property values to be. So even when you get responsible leadership, good decision making, practical ways of tackling it, you, you've then got to somehow overcome yeah. these sorts of um, reactions or responses. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, and this happens, and that's because uh, you know some of the, the values um, that are being expressed there are ones which actually say um, it's it's about private benefit and it's about the short term rather than than the alternatives. Uh, so, so a lot of what you just said was actually essentially an institutionally mediated um, response, uh, which uh, you know in, in a political circumstance will allow those values to be expressed. But you can have similarly institutionally mediated responses which are different from that. Um, and one of those would be, say, for example, insurance, uh, uh, where insurance companies are actually now um, starting to be much more um, specific in terms of the uh, um, uh, you know the the amount that people have to pay um, to, to the premiums to actually get insurance covered in, in particular locations. So you're actually seeing the risk associated with those locations being expressed in you know, through insurance. And so if you're a purchaser of that property, if you actually want to understand about that risk, you actually have a source where you can go from. Um, there's also uh, other sort of information which people can start to make their own assessment of risk, um, such as uh, you know, products which look at sea level, um, change and uh, you know, changes in coastlines. Um, so, for example, a few years ago um, there was uh, media about how the areas around Coleroy in Sydney uh, would would essentially disappear under sea level rise scenarios and storm surge scenarios in the future, and uh, and that impacted on property prices there. Uh, so that had that wasn't mediated by the local government. It was actually you know, you know, a, a result of um, information which was available to the broader community. So my view on this one is uh, we need to have mechanisms which get information about risk and change and risk um, out to people who, who are making purchasing or other decisions and uh, and uh, ensuring that that's broadly known and understood in terms of the concept of it. <coughs> and then that puts uh, the onus on uh, various sort of institutions, including local government or companies, to actually take that into account when they're actually investing in public or private money. So in, in my view, information is the but I think that's playing out uh, into that leadership question you raised before and just providing the information. I mean, count one councils get very nervous about how they present the information because they're likely to get the backlash um, in the community if they if it's seen to be presenting a threat to the things that people value. So I think along with the information, you need to have the leadership of someone, you know, the person who's able to carry the narrative why this information is important and uh, and some sort of strategy for managing the distributional issues. Uh, and just following off on that, I mean, I think you said that I said something was rational. I think that almost all people would say that they make rational decisions because they frame those decisions around their values, <coughs> information sets, their objectives. The local people are making a very rational decision about <coughs> avoiding information about sea level rise because their values are that their inherent house, property, whatever, is more important than a potential uncertain long term risk. That's perfectly rational. As is the concern of another group that says that perhaps they want to protect those people's interests, the insurance company or whatever. We have to be careful about using the word rational. Um, and, and you often are very careful. Yeah. So, so in fact, I'll, yeah. um, but I agree with your point. Yeah. Um, when I actually said um, your point yeah. about rationality was actually raising the question of rationality and irrationality. Yeah. It wasn't saying that you know, we, we need to be rational beings. So, so it was merely the fact that we'd actually raised that point. That was, yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, your colleague Craig Coleman presented here last week and about the communication issues around this and pointing to behavioural 
things. And you know, one point he made here I thought was quite significant. People do make decisions based primarily on their emotions or their values for a start. The rational analysis of the information comes second in the, in the stage of thinking. But also, um, more intelligent people are often the more or more sophisticated they get at justifying the decisions based around their emotions. So simply providing more information to intelligent people doesn't necessarily mean they're going to change their decision either. So that, that's part of the sort of being aware of the sort of information deficit sort of model. Mm. It's just about um, you know, just going and create information without a context and yeah. without a, um, you know, a demand. You mentioned also uh, the idea of targeting services to areas that are uh, you know, subject to uh, sort of changes. It's probably a, a bit um, politically unacceptable, politically fraught, with you know, danger. Is there any areas that you've seen a phased or strategic retreat actually being a sensible <coughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in some in some ways, you know, I mean, there's no young people in the country anymore, and I would argue that might have a lot to do with your suicide, perhaps more than more than anything. Um, but you know, is there are areas that should be sort of left to naturally occupy, or some areas that we shouldn't shouldn't be trying to uh, adapt to? It's a complex question. Um, I mean, gen generally speaking, in, in Australia, we sort of run off a, a sort of a pseudo market based uh, you know, approach to, to things. And uh, so, where, where, where people make their own decisions and take their own risks, and there's various ways of managing you know, those risks. Uh, and, uh, and, and politically, because we've sort of adopted that you know, almost universally as a, as a sort of an approach um, in the policy domains. There's, there's a lot of reluctance to actually sort of say, you know, this area of agricultural land is going to become, you know, unviable for agriculture, and I can give you a good example of why. So, um, and and likewise, you know, in terms of coastal zone management, uh, and because you know, there's significant uncertainty about various factors, and, and you know, to, to sort of uh, you know make exclusionary decisions um, places people. Are... I guess I'm not talking about sort of such direct intervention, but. So certainly any policy that any adaptation policy is going to have some kind of effect on those sort of risk taking decisions. So there is an implicit um, intervention. It doesn't have to be, you can't run wheat in Geraldton anymore or whatever, but there might be some particular, I don't know, other less um, direct intervention that will have that. I don't know, we'll push the risk onto the farmers of them that they won't grow when they're in the honour of business as usual scenario or something. Yeah, I, and, and that, that would just be you know, an individual's decision as to what they do with you know, their asset, etc. Um, the, the, the test would be um, largely around um, public, public benefit, public policy <coughs> sort of issues, and so whether this is something that uh, you know, affects uh, you know, other groups, other individuals, um, significant externalities in terms of the environment, and whether that then requires some sort of uh, policy, policy response, uh, which wouldn't necessarily be um, taken up by an individual. And so, I mean, policy is all about mediating those responses, and so that would be where that comes in. Um, but, but I think that, generally speaking, is that uh, the, the approach of governments would be to, um, to, to support more effective decision making. Um, rather than to, to uh, constrain that decision making by some, some options are out of, out of bounds. Um, so they only do that with a sort of case for them. And that would be consistent with the sort of broader um, approach that we've adopted in Australia. But you go to different countries, of course, it's very different. And so this is you know, part of that sort of bigger sort of socio political sort of environment which we operate, and which are often very, is often visible to us. You know, but I, but I think one example of you're talking about is like the Collyandley, I think, the irrigation district that when water trading came in, they basically voted as a block or a majority of people said we're going to sell our water and turn off the pipe to this particular location. You know, it's I don't know how many hundred farmers that were. But that was partly or mainly an economic decision. Yeah, well, effectively, but it was as a result of a 
reduction yeah. supply of water and capacity to use water in different ways. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, I mean, but it's, that's consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess the question is whether it's done without the consent or knowledge of those. And I mean, certainly it's consistent with the sort of broader trend in terms of consolidation of community services in the rural areas. I mean, the school falls below a certain number of students, you know, that's it. So there is definitely a kind of um, tipping point kind of mm -hmm. um, scenario for some of these um, rural things which climate change will simply add exacerbate. Yeah, especially climate change vulnerability is taken to be a, a bottom up adaptive capacity measure as well. So we sort of almost penalising in that sense. So, so the particular example where I referred to services was in relation to suicide and rural counselling. And so, so you know, given we're operating in a, a constrained budgetary environment in, in most respects, um, not a lot. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the question which will be asked of those sort of services is um, can you improve your efficiency? So, you know, can you uh, do more with less? And, uh, and so, and the point I was making is that if you have some useful, you know, good information about um, how to more effectively target those services, you can, you can actually do that. Um, but of course, the, there are limits to, to um, you know, what you can do uh, in those circumstances. So, so again, the question would be, uh, you know, whether there was a perceived a, a broader public interest in having rural counselling services um, by, you know, removing that, those sort of disruptions from from you know, rural communities that occur when you have you know, lots of people under stress and can be expressed in different ways. And so, um, so, so the the analysis at this point in time would be, um, yes, there is a broader public interest, and so we're prepared to support those counselling services. Um, if you look twenty years down the track, where you know, climate risk may change dramatically and, and, and perspectives about you know, public good, etc. may have changed, the, the answer to that might be quite different. Thank you, well, thank you very much.